It is my absolute pleasure to present this series from Matt Thornton entitled Wokeness, Public Safety, BLM, and Antifa. Matt's been teaching functional martial arts for more than 30 years and holds a fifth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. His organization, Straight Blast Gym, has more than 70 locations worldwide and has produced champion MMA fighters as well as world-class self-defense and law enforcement instructors. Matt has a forthcoming book from Pitchstone Press entitled The Gift of Violence, Practical Knowledge for Surviving and Thriving in a Dangerous World. Matt's also one of my best friends. In this series, Matt speaks plainly and bluntly about physical violence. It's extraordinarily rare to hear someone so knowledgeable speak so clearly about such controversial and taboo topics. I'm confident you'll enjoy the series and truly learn from it. There are people walking around right now, there always have been, there always will be people walking around our planet who don't care about hurting other people. They would gladly hurt you or your children not think twice about it. We need to understand those people exist, they're there. The only thing that stops them is violence or the threat of violence. That's it. The reality is the only thing that's ever made the world more peaceful is the ability to engage in violence, to threaten violence, or to protect people from violence. My name's Matt Thornton. I'm the president and founder of SBG International. It's a worldwide organization. It's been around for 30 plus years, teaching functional martial arts, self-defense, and teaching the average person, everyday person, how to be safer. We have over 70 locations all over the world, and the clubs vary in different sizes. Uh, some of our instructors will focus more on makes martial arts, for example, SBG Ireland with Conor McGregor. Some of our instructors will focus more on functional self-defense, law enforcement, and uh, police training like Paul Sharp. I've been working on this book for about eight years, and what I did was I took the information that I've learned over the last three decades and tried to distill it down and offer it to people to help them become safer, help them have a better relationship to the topic. I had a friend of mine who was just here last weekend who's a retired police officer that worked in various capacities in some of the rougher areas of Chicago, as well as an undercover officer in motorcycle gangs and different things throughout the years. He was involved in an undercover operation one time downtown Chicago, not that long ago. They were waiting for uh, their informant to show up at this particular location. They heard gunshots just a block away, multiple gunshots. So there's a gun battle going on. My friend looked at the other officers he was with, and he's like, hey, man, if you guys want to run and jump on that, I can wait here for the guy, and you guys can go take care of that. And looked at him, and they said, why? If we go there, and we, we catch him, and we shoot him, and we wind up in a conflict, we're going to wind up on CNN, and we're going to wind up prosecuted. If we go there, and we don't catch him in the act, but we arrest him, the district attorney's going to let him go. They'll be out on the street, no matter what, before we even finish doing our paperwork. There's the reality of police officers day after day going into the worst, most violent areas any city has, putting their life on the line literally to arrest people who are hurting innocent people, and then watching those people walk completely free because the district attorney refuses to press charges, not because there's not evidence, but because they're pursuing some form of social justice. How many times does an officer have to do that before he just says there's no point? There's no point. He's going to be back on the street before I even finish doing my paperwork. He's going to be back out there. For the justice system to work, everybody has to be involved. The district attorney has to be willing to prosecute. The police officers have to know that the city council, the mayor, have their back, will protect them if they're actually doing their job well in the way they should be, if they're doing it correctly. And then they have to know that the district attorney is going to press charges and prosecute these people. And when that happens, you can very quickly clean up a city and make it safer. We have evidence of this. You can see what happened in New York. New York in the 70s looked a lot like New York starting to look now. Yet they did a complete turnaround. And for a while, for a while, New York was one of the safest big cities on planet Earth. I was there during that time. I was walking around at 3 a.m. with my wife and I felt perfectly safe. It's not like that anymore. For it to be like that again, we'll have to do what they did, which is prosecute, put lots more officers on the street, stop the bad guys, prosecute the bad guys, get them locked away because it's the same violent people committing the same crimes over and over again. That's what has to happen. 
That's not happening now, and everybody has to be involved. The police officers can't do that part by themselves. A good example of a naive notion would be when Joe Biden was running for president, he talked about maybe the officer could shoot the guy in the leg. So instead of anybody coming at you, the first thing you do is shoot to kill, you shoot him in the leg. Anybody that has any experience with firearms understands that's a ridiculous notion, but there's probably many Americans who looked at that and thought, well, that makes sense. Why didn't you shoot him in the leg? And then they're going to have misguided opinions about what a particular police officer did or didn't do in a given situation because they don't understand how violence works. Just to give you a brief overview on that. Most gunfights, most exchanges with firearms occur at very close range and most of the shots miss. So a police officer who doesn't even get that much training with his weapon to begin with, it's not like we're dealing with a SEAL Team 6 member, is looking to hit center mass on the target. And the reason they're shooting is not to kill anybody, they're shooting to stop. They're shooting to stop the threat from other people, like recently happened when that police officer had to shoot the girl who was about to stick the giant steak knife into another child. He shot that girl because he had to stop the threat. If he hadn't shot her, she would have stabbed that young lady. They're shooting to stop, and they're shooting center mass. The idea that in a conflict like that, your adrenaline's going, and you pull your firearm, and you're going to shoot the gun out of his hand or shoot him in the leg is stupid, number one. Number two, there's big arteries and things in the leg, so it's just as deadly to shoot somebody in the leg, really, as it is anywhere else. And number three, you can shoot someone in the leg, they can still be on the ground if they have a weapon on their person, draw their weapon, shoot and kill you, or shoot other people and kill them. You have to stop them and stop them from accessing whatever tool they have on their body at the time so that they don't hurt anyone else. And that means in any given situation, officers are going to be shooting to hit the target center mass. Joe Biden's been around long enough that he should know better. He doesn't. I think he said it out of ignorance. That's fine. Unfortunately, he has obviously a big platform, and people might listen to that and think, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So the more people are educated on violence, how violence works, how these conflicts work, why officers are actually doing what they're doing, the better able they are to vote on public policy. I think it's critically important for us to just stand on the anti-racist position that if there's a racial disparity that's shown via racial data, then there must be something wrong with policy as opposed to people. And so then our job, when the data shows that disparity, is to figure out what policies are causing this disparity. That statement by Kendi is absurd on its face. The moment you start to think about it, it just starts to fall apart. The vast majority of the people that police arrest, put in jail, and put to prison for violence are male. Does it automatically mean they're sexist against men? The average Asian American income is higher than the average white American income. Does that mean we're racist against whites and this system is designed in such a way to help Asian Americans? The top educated demographic in the United States are Nigerian immigrants. Does that mean that the United States is geared towards helping Nigerian immigrants? So the whole thing is absurd on its face. What you have to do when you see a discrepancy in the data is you have to control for the different reasons why that discrepancy might be there. That is, if what you're interested in is actually the truth, which should be what you're interested in if you're actually thinking about solving it. I don't think Kendi or people like that have any interest in solving anything, which is why the truth isn't that important. But if the truth is important to you, then when somebody says this particular correlation equals causation, well, then we have to start controlling for all the other things that could be if we want to find out what's true and what's not true. It reminds me very much of the creationist argument for how the world was created. Anytime there was no definitive evolutionary answer for why something existed, or even if there was a good answer, but it wasn't well known, so they will say, well, therefore must be God, the God of the gaps argument. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He's saying any discrepancy in the data, therefore must equal racism. If you're interested in the truth, then you can't accept that answer. It might be racism, absolutely. But the only way to find out if it's racism is to control for the other things that it could be. That's just basic logic and common sense. Every citizen who, who's listening to this that has any kind of education at all should know that. And that sh alone should be enough to tell you that these people aren't sincere.
Let me explain why misgendering is an act of violence. We are here today not because we don't know how to take a joke. We're here because we're concerned that the jokes are taking lives. We don't want you to speak here. Your words are violence. They're threats. You cannot be speaking here. Thank you very much. It's a baby. Yes. If someone was raped and she gave birth and she decided to kill her three-year-old child. So that's backwards, pernicious, dangerous, and stupid. And it comes as a result, in some ways, of a good thing. And the good thing is that violence over the long term has been on a steady decline. We're nearing a spike now, thanks to the woke. But prior to this, for a long term, violence has been on the decline. And for a lot of people in the United States, they don't really have that much experience with actual violence. And that's a good thing. I don't want people to have experience with violence. But that leads them to labeling something like language as violence. Language is not violence. And we don't want to minimize what real violence is. When someone puts their hands on somebody else and refuses to take them off, when someone physically rapes someone or assaults someone or punches someone or sets them on fire or shoots them, that is a very, very serious thing. Words are not violence. Silence is not violence. Violence is violence. It's a very serious thing, and it needs to be kept distinct from that. The cure, especially for political violence, is to talk. Like, the options that we have as human beings, if we have completely different ideas about how public policy should be, are to communicate with each other and to reach some sort of consensus, either through politics or in the academy. That's what should be going on. It should be a dialogue. The worst thing you could possibly do is shut down that dialogue, refuse to allow that dialogue, because then all you've done is you've opened it up for the only other option, which is violence. You're actually creating violence by labeling words as violence and by trying to stifle freedom of speech or stop someone else who has an idea from talking, you're actually making it more likely that there'll be real violence. And real violence, like I just said, is a very distinct and different thing from words, and that should never be forgotten. Oak ideology intersects with what I do when the topic of violence is presented. It becomes an issue in terms of misinformation, misinformation about who commits violence, about why those people commit violence, about how violence is committed, about solutions to violence. And then that misinformation, unfortunately, becomes public policy and the net result is more violence and increased death, increased homicides. It's a pretty serious topic. It's a discussion that requires data and requires understanding how violent conflicts occur, how they're actually solved, who's involved. Having the right information on that particular topic is vital, especially if we're going to base public policy on it. Woke ideology often comes in backwards with misinformation. The net result we can see around the country in my own city in Portland where homicides have tripled, shootings have tripled. There's going to be a lot more dead bodies because of this misinformation. So it's very important to try and get people to actually go back and look at the evidence and to understand how these, these things actually work as opposed to how they're being told they work. But let me give you a concrete example. We have a councilwoman here in Portland named Joanne Hardesty. Joanne Hardesty was the person behind defunding the Portland Police Department and getting rid of what we called the GVRT, which is the Gun Violence Response Team. So the late 80s through early 90s, throughout the United States, we had a spike in violent crime, mostly related to gang and drug-related murders all across the United States and in Portland. They created the Gun Violence Response Team and basically solved the problem. As they solved the problem, you saw a major drop in those kind of homicides. She came in and was vital in getting rid of the GBRT and in defunding the Portland Police Department. If you ask her why she did that, she'll send you a canned response. And then she explains that the gun violence response team was spending 65% of its time in the black community, which is really only about 18% of the population of Portland, therefore racist. That's why she had to get rid of it. Since she's gotten rid of it, gang shootings have skyrocketed. There's three to four times as many shootings as there was before, and three to four times as many dead bodies as they were before, and guess who those victims are? So not only was the gang violence response team not racist, they actually knew exactly how much time they needed to spend within that community to solve that problem. 
Well, my question for someone like Joanne Hardesty is when she talks to the mother of a dead little boy here in Portland who was shot, is she going to explain to him that that little boy only deserves 18% of the police department's time because he's black and not 65%, which is really what's going on here. So you can see when you break it down by the data and you look at the actual evidence, her solution was backwards, but the entire thing started because of a false premise. Because the police department is spending this much time in the black community, police department's racist. No, the police department was spending that much time in the black community because that's where the gangs were. And now that they're gone, the victims are mostly in that community as well. So the people who suffer the most are the ones that the woke, in this particular case, Joanne Hardesty, pretend to care about. All the solutions to woke ideology begin with educating people because it all starts with miseducation. The defund the police movement is a perfect example of this. The average leftist who's part of the woke ideology who buys into that believes that American police officers are walking the streets with the intention to murder black citizens. There is no evidence to show that. There's zero evidence to show that there never was. It all begins with a lie. It all begins with telling people that they're out there trying to murder black citizens and taking one particular incident, highlighting it on video, repeating it over and over again with a narrative that the entire media, like the mockingbirds that they are, repeats endlessly. And then people walk around and think something that's actually backwards. The first thing we have to do is start talking about the data. We have to present this case. About half of all America's murders occur in eight zip codes. And they're committed by a very small demographic of young black men who are between the ages of 15 and 24. They commit about half of the murders in the United States. Usually their victims look just like they do. Most crime is intraracial. So it's black people killing black people, white people killing white people. That's because more often than not, the person knows the suspect. And even when they don't, the majority of crime is within race, intraracial. Those are the facts. The police are in those zip codes, not because they're racist, but because that's where the crime is. And they're the only people who are willing to go in there and put their life on the line to stop it. The police need to go where the violence is if we want the police to stop the violence and if we want to see less dead bodies on the street. To do that, we have to be honest about where that violence is. And when you remove them from the neighborhoods, from the zip codes where they're needed, all that happens is many more innocent people. You can see what's going on in Chicago right now. Young black children ages four through eight getting shot every weekend with drive-bys that are going wild. Ignoring that fact, pretending that fact's not true, the ultimate victims of that aren't going to be white Americans. It's not going to be me. It's going to be poor black Americans who are stuck in those zip codes where 60 or 70 percent of the gang shootings in the United States occur. Places like Chicago and Baltimore, their kids are the ones that are going to be shot because we're not being honest about the numbers. And that's between 7,000 and 8,000 homicides per year. And keep in mind, many of those are kids and children that are accidentally shot in drive-bys in places like Chicago and Baltimore. Then when you look at the number of unarmed black Americans who are killed by police officers, it averages about 12, 12 to 14. Small enough every year that you can actually go back and look at each individual case, which I would strongly suggest everybody listening to me does. And when you do, you'll see that the term unarmed is actually misapplied. You have in one case, the suspect was trying to run the police officers over with a car. In another case, the suspect had a female police officer on the ground and was trying to beat her to death with her radio. These are the kind of things that get listed as unarmed. In reality, when you remove those cases from the data, you're left with one or two. One or two cases every year out of a country of 350 million some odd people here. One or two cases. That's what Black Lives Matter is focusing on. They have things to say about just about everything except the seven to 8,000 homicides per year of young black Americans. So number one, they're lying. And number two, what I'd like everybody listening and hearing me and watching this to do is check those numbers. Check those numbers for yourself. Go back and look at it. And then ask yourself once you've done that, why BLM doesn't talk about that issue. And once you do that, I think you'll realize that BLM is actually part of the problem. What they've done is they've created a situation in the United States where proactive policing is not happening. The police are not going out and uh, actively making the arrests of gang members, which in times past is what has stopped a lot of these gang shootings. They're defunding the police. 
NYPD cut its non-uniform division completely, so there are no undercover officers on the street there. And the net result of that's going to be, over the next couple years, thousands more dead black Americans than there otherwise would be. The only thing that's going to stop that violence is armed good people getting the armed bad people out of the neighborhood, arrested, and locked up. That's the only thing that's going to solve that problem. That's just the reality of how our world works. You need to have, and it needs to begin with public safety. The sidewalks need to be safe to walk down. The store needs to be safe to go to. People need to understand that they're not going to be shot when they're at the red light. Their kid's not going to be killed in the baby seat while they're driving through an intersection. So until you get that under control, nothing else is going to happen. Again, average black American between the ages of 12 to 24 is 13 times more likely to be murdered than a white American. 90% of these shootings are done by the same demographic, which are young, 15 to 24-year-old, primarily African-American, fatherless children, killing other young African-American fatherless children over issues related to status. Understand that that's what's going on. People who say pointing that out is just a racist act, to me, that's, it's not even a logical statement because you're pointing out a fact. If there's true racism within the system, then we need to identify it. Let's find out where it is so we can remove it. I'm 100% on board with that goal. Unless someone else has another solution, the only way I know that we can do that is to look at the data and to control for different possible scenarios that would explain that. The fact of the matter is you can control for education, you can control for household income, you can control for unemployment, you can control for all this and still see large discrepancies in the numbers between different racial groups in the United States as far as crime. The only statistic that I've seen that actually matches and when you control for it makes sense as it relates to the violence we're seeing, not just in the black community, but everywhere all over the world, and especially in the United States, is out of wedlock birth rates. The moment you start controlling for that, then you're going to start to see those numbers correlate with the areas where all the violence is occurring. In the black community, out of wedlock birth rate is over 70%. When we get into the neighborhoods in Chicago and Baltimore, it's closer to 95%. These are young black women having young kids. Those kids grow to the dangerous age of 12 to 19, where we all like to get in trouble. There's no male mentors or fathers around. They form gangs and they shoot each other over petty disputes related to status. This isn't happening because of hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake. This is happening because somebody stepped on somebody else's shoe or something like that, and the next thing you know, there's gonna be a drive-by shooting. The only thing that's gonna stop that short-term is putting more police in those neighborhoods to save lives. That's the only thing that's gonna stop that. Long-term, we have to be thinking about how we can disincentivize young people from having kids when they're not married, when they're still in high school, when they're 12 to 18. That's the problem that needs to be addressed. It's also something that nobody wants to talk about in the United States. There's a lot of lying and a lot of obfuscation around it, but the numbers are very clear. Again, I'd encourage everybody to go and take a look at it themselves. When you talk about the reasons why the out of wedlock birth rate is so much higher, that's something I think we as a society and people much smarter than me need to sit down and, and really assess and try and figure out what led to that. But what I can tell you is it wasn't always that way. The out of wedlock birth rate in the black community was actually almost the same and in some cases a little bit higher than white Americans up until about 1963. Something happened around 1963 where they started to diverge and the out of wedlock birth rate rose across the board in the white community, but especially in the black community. If you go back prior to 1963, you don't see these kind of numbers and you also don't see this kind of violence and this kind of crime. Once we go past 1963, that's when it skyrockets. Now, what happened in 1963 that explains this? I'm sure it's a complicated problem. It's probably gonna to admit to more than one answer, but it is something that we need to look at. And one of the things I think we need to look at is whatever economic incentives might have been well-intentioned, but put in place, which caused this problem to happen. Because if we don't look at that and we repeat that same mistake, once again, there's gonna be a lot more violence and a lot more innocent victims shot and dead.